Commissioner Treese? Here. Commissioner Rogers? Here. Chair Harrington? Here. And I'll announce that Commissioner Scouten and Willie are on vacation and excused from tonight's meeting. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Uh, before we get started, I'll just make a couple of announcements with regard to tonight's agenda. Uh, under presentations, we'll be swapping the order of items A and B. So we'll start with presenting the 2020 Harold M. Haynes Award recipient and then move on to the COVID-19 presentation. Under the action section of the agenda, item D as in dog has been added from the County Administrative Office to authorize the use of electronic board signatures for approval of board meeting items. On the consent agenda, we also have an additional item, item K as in Catherine, uh, under support services to adopt the resolution in order to amend the fiscal year 2020-21 pay plan and position and salary report. Are there any other changes to today's consent agenda? Okay, well then, we'll get into our meeting. First item on the agenda is oral communications. Mr. Moss, do we have anyone signed up for tonight? Yes, we do, Madam Chair. We have one sign up, Mr. Dale Feek. So I will let him. Dale, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me, Kevin? You're a little yes. low on your voice. Oh, well, if I have a real problem, I have to switch over to a different system. I have everything as high as I can. Can you it hear me, Catherine Harrington? Yes, I just turned my speaker volume way up. Thank you very much. All right, please go ahead, Dale, for up to two minutes. Thank you. I'm Dale Feek, Chair of the Washington County Citizen Action Network, known as WCCAN, Coalition of Grassroots Advocates dedicated to improving the quality of life in Washington County by promoting healthy and sustainable communities, social and economic justice, and open and responsive government, as you are. So, Madam Chair, Catherine Harrington, Commissioners, Willie, I know you're not here, but it's important for you to hear. And Commissioner Scouten, uh, Rogers and Trees. When I signed up to make public comment, I wrote that my topic would be public records request. I learned that Philip Bransford is the person who receives the request. I had a chance to talk with Philip today and he's working with others in the county to address my concern before I make public comment about it before you. I emailed you written comment about the written public comment I submitted to the Environmental Quality Commission DEQ and be summarizing as oral comment, comment to them November the 19th. I quote from my previous comment to you, well, that I made to you about the state climate change framework, in particular the transportation sector as it relates to jet air contrails and climate change. You commissioners, Therese and Scouten might want to click on some of the links because they are about Pam Burden's two children. Nico and Isaac, who live in Beaverton and who are two of the 21 youth suing the federal government over climate change. I asked the Washington County Commissioners, you, this is what I said to the Environment Quality Commission, to be leaders in helping get adopted a strong state climate adaption framework. In October 2020, written comment, in the written comment to you, I said to the Environment Quality Commission, the youth acting for our Earth youth leaders, Miko and Isaac Bergen, two of the 21 youth who are suing the federal government over climate change to ensure that the legal right to a stable climate is protected. But they stated, we're never too young to lead. I said to the county commissioner, I would hope that you are never too old to lead. Thank you, please lead in climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Feek. Kevin, do we have anyone else? We do not, Madam Chair. All righty, thank you. We'll then move on to our consent agenda. Tonight's consent agenda consists of 14 items, three sets of minutes, three items under clean water services, four items under land use and transportation, one item under county administrative office, two items under support services, and one item under service district for lighting. By the way, how is my volume? You are good, Madam Chair. Okay, alrighty. So those are the uh, subset or list of items on the consent agenda. 
What are the approval. wishes of the board tonight? Move for approval, Madam Chair. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve tonight's consent agenda. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries three to zero. Thank you, commissioners. Next, we move on to presentations. Our first presentation will be, uh, I believe from the county for committee, excuse me, the committee for community uh, involvement. Who's doing our intro to kick us off? I think we might have a few people. Are, will they be coming up on video or just audio? Uh, they will be coming up on video, Madam Chair. So we have Amanda Garcia Snell to present the report to you. Okay. Hi, Amanda Garcia Snell, Community Engagement Manager. And I'm really here to uh, introduce a couple of our uh, Committee for Community Involvement leaders, uh, longstanding volunteers for the county that we're so appreciative of, uh, Committee for Community Involvement Chair, Kathy Stahlkamp and Co-Secretary Bruce Bartlett. And I will hand it over to them. Well, I'm hoping we can get their video right away. There's Kathy, hi. And is Bruce joining us by video? Oh, Kathy, you're still muted. Let's let's check and make sure both of your audios work first. Greetings, Earthlings. Hi, Bruce. <laughs> hi. Kathy, how about you? Still can't hear you. Bummer. Uh, Kathy, we cannot hear you. You're unmuted on our end. How about that little sound icon in the bottom bar on your computer? Nope. Bummer. Kathy, did you just say bummer? Oh, I did. I heard that. Well, you did, <laughs> Catherine. Well, um, Nadia Hassan and Ashley Hartmeyer Prigg be involved with this? So they are both award recipients. And I think uh, in lieu of Kathy's um, mic troubles, I think we'll pass it to Bruce to, to uh, present the award and give a little bit of background. Great. Well, hopefully Kathy had a chance to email to Bruce the comments. Yeah. Hi. So uh, we are gathered here in this segment to present the Harold Haynes Citizen Involvement Award. And this has been going on for about 15 years. I was fortunate to be awarded the uh, award in 2004, which kind of speaks to how long I've been doing this. Um, without knowing who Harold Haynes was, it's a little bit uh, disorienting to try to uh, uh, feel very excited about what, about the award. Um, I was fortunate to know Harold Haynes as a young man, and uh, I was friends with his son James, and we went to the same church, and we were uh, friends. I heard the first Beatles song in his basement, as a matter of fact. Um, Harold was a professor of optometry at Pacific University and was a political firebrand uh, amongst the staff. Ross Dondero is also a uh, professor of political science at Pacific University and was a previous nominee for the Harold Haynes Award. Uh, Harold organized the, uh, the faculty at Pacific University to take on a variety of uh, pertinent uh, chores in the uh, Forest Grove area. And if you go to the Forest Grove Citizen Involvement website, you'll see a myriad of different committees that sprung from his work to uh, uh, enhance Forest Grove's involvement process. He also was very diligent in pursuing statewide issues and uh, uh, single-handedly, in a lot of cases, uh, moved mountains. Uh, it was for this kind of work that he was uh, uh, that he was tapped to be the namesake of the award. And uh, 
he was not one to suffer fools and he was a very fact-based man, which uh, is refreshing in anybody in these days. Uh, the, the nominees for the award this year that did not get it, um, I'm just briefly mentioned them. Uh, Glendora Clay, Clay Brooks served as a member of the Commission on Children and Families, uh, is now a member of the Washington County uh, Children Advisory Network, and was also uh, served on the Oregon Equity of Inclusion Cultural Competence Continuing Education Review Committee, uh, Healthcare for All Oregon. Uh, Blake Dye was nominated. He was a member of the first cohort of the Washington County Civic Leaders Program. He was recently elected vice chair of ERMDAC. He's been working closely with Adelante Mujeres, who, an organization which looks to uh, uh, enhance the, the uh, work of Latina women and is also board chairman of the Blueprint Foundation, a mentoring organization in Portland. The King City Community Foundation was nominated as a group and they uh, have uh, sponsored a number of activities without any discrimination to race, color, gender, political belief, religious affiliation, age, which I appreciate, and any other affiliation. They work with the police department and with the Twalton Valley Fire and Rescue. Sam Locke, civic activist. Katie Riley, who was previous uh, chair of the Washington County Commission on Children and uh, Families. And Jill Warren, who is a uh, uh, activist uh, who has been working on the significant natural resource uh, update and the Washington County Master Gardener Association, uh, which is uh, run by the Oregon State Extension Service. And uh, the Master Gardener Program had 37,000 people sign up to take a free vegetable gardening course when the pandemic started. And they are involved in, in various school projects. They have a demonstration garden in conjunction with PCC Rock Creek. And uh, they are just a powerhouse of vegetable uh, activity. Which brings me to the winner of this year's Harold Haynes Award, the Twalton Hills Park and Recreation District Visioning Task Force. And unfortunately, THPRD is an unpronounceable acronym, so you just have to say THPRD. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the group consisted of 13 people. And in order to introduce that group, I would like to, well, let me see if uh, Jaz Preet is online. She is not online. Okay, so I will take it away. Um, the, THPRD staff member, Jaspreet Kahal, uh, is the community engagement specialist for uh, THPRD, and she's supported by Holly Anderson. The members of the group include Olivia Brown, Ronald Ferguson, America Rodriguez, Hister Victor Seen, Holly Van Houten, Ann Albrick, Richard Goldner, Sharia Jane, Reed Quiggins, Rachel Gowland, Kathy Karmaputan Fan, then uh, this name, Iwentu Siga and Nadia Hassan are all members who spent hundreds of hours over the last year uh, leading an extensive citizen engagement effort to form a vision for the future of the park district based on needs. They didn't show up simply they were intimately involved in the entire process they designed the outreach process selected where when and how the task force time and energy would be used they attended dozens of meetings and used that experience to shape the next round of outreach they attended 117 events collect uh, uh, and community meetings and they talked to more than 10,000 people collected 12,000 ideas and nurtured the conversation along the way. Uh, they never said no to an idea. They put them all together. They were welcoming and inclusive. 
uh, minimizing in a, or eliminating barriers to participation. Uh, they, uh, uh, all, they want people to play, move, and interact with THPRD. They, uh, uh, the themes uh, related to the overall maintenance of facilities and equipment and ability of THPRD to respond to all of the uh, amenities safely. And THPRD does a great job in preserving natural spaces. And they had a number of ideas for trails, recreation, travel, interaction with animals and regional connection, the regional trail system. Um, they were able to do all this work in a very short period of time with a, a great level of commitment. And they are dedicated to reaching the entire community, ensuring the ideas, thoughts, and feedback collected represented the entire population of the district and our incredibly rich diversity here. So I would like to uh, thank the uh, visioning board for their work and congratulate them on their uh, uh, rece uh, on receiving this award this year. And Bruce, we have Ashley Hartmeyer Prigg, who's the THPRD uh, board president or chair president. Okay. And uh, Nadia Hassan, who's on the visioning task force. And I think if I'm um, not mistaken, you both may want to say a few words. Yes, and, Jazz, and Jazz Preet was able to join us as well. So in case she wanted to say something too. Um, Good evening, everyone. I think um, I was I was on the call, but I, you couldn't see or hear me. So I there may have been some technical glitches, but I think Bruce did a wonderful job of introducing everyone. Um, thank you. Um, as Catherine Harrington, Chair uh, Chair Harrington, you mentioned, my name is Josephine Chahel, and I serve as a community engagement specialist for the Park District. And for the past year, I have had the huge honor and privilege of working with. Uh, the Visioning Task Force and the leading this work. Um, I will keep uh, it very short and brief. I will pass on the mic to our uh, uh, board president, Ashley hartmeyer Prague and Nadia Hassan to share a few words about their experience and um, carry on from there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jess Breed. Um, I am Ashley hartmeyer Prigg. Um, I just want to say thank you to the Washington County Board of Commissioners and Washington County Committee for Community Involvement for this recognition. What an amazing group to be considered with for this award. It was so wonderful to hear about the other um, projects and people. Um, and I also wanna say a huge thank you to our amazing Visioning Task Force volunteers for all of their leadership, their time, their enthusiasm. These volunteers were dedicated and they went everywhere. They were a true example of an inclusive outreach process, which resulted in a report that matches the amazing diverse community we serve. Our task force volunteers had seven different language abilities and they were leaders in welcoming diverse input. Our board has made it one of our core values to stay true to the community vision and it will guide our work for years to come. Nadia. Hello and good evening, everyone. I want to start off and thank you all. Uh, my name is Nadia Hassan and I am a member of the Visioning Task Force. Really want to say that what an amazing opportunity to connect with authentic community and, and speak with residents. What I did and what the members of our task force did was go out and just talk to people. And when kids said, we want to see a zoo, we were like, okay, we'll write down zoo, right? And we might not be able to get a zoo, but we took every single piece of information that people asked from us, everything that they wanted to see. And we collected that data and we made sure that that data was shown in a way to represent what our communities wanted. And we made sure that we went not just to our traditional events, but to other events as well to ensure that every voice was heard. I want to take a moment and just really quickly recognize, I know Bruce said the names, I just want to say them one more time because they are such important people in this work and the hours that we that we spent talking to these people. I remember being out in the rain and doing this. Um, so America Rodriguez, Anne Albrich, Unitu Tsibao, and I'm so sorry for the way I, I pronounced that wrong. Holly Van. I did. <laughs> Holly Van Newton, Kanti Karambun Atan, 
Uh, myself, Nadia Hassan, Olivia Brown, Rachel Gowan, Reed Quiggins, Richard Goldner, Ronald Ferguson, Shreya Jane, and Victor Sin. And I would also want to make a, just a quick thank you to THPRD for believing in all of us. Uh, I shared this story. I was, uh, I had a two day old when I applied and had an interview with the lovely individuals from THPRD, and they welcomed my three month old baby to every single meeting that we had. And that type of inclusion to, for a mom to be able to bring their baby to meetings was so impactful and meaningful. And the passes that they provided us as sort of a compensation to be able to participate in THPRD facilities and use them felt so meaningful for me as a member of the community. And I'm just so thankful to Ashley and the rest of the board. And Bruce, thank you so much for this recognition and everyone else. We really appreciate it. Commissioners, any comments? Well, I'd like to jump in and say many, many congratulations. First, first a special thank you to uh, Kathy and Bruce for all the work that goes into making this award, uh, to reviewing the applications, and to making the difficult decisions that you have to make. Yeah. So, yeah. so thank you for that. And it was so impressive to hear the, the group of um, applicants, so to speak. Uh, secondly, uh, my, my hat is always off to THPRD. You guys do such a great job. And the fact that you see this, this need and, uh, and underwrite it, support it, and uh, you know, make, make this a possibility for our community is just outstanding. And Nadia, to you and to the whole group, thank you. Thank you for your work in the community. Thank you for... Uh, talking with the people that, that tell you that they'd like a zoo, whatever that zoo means. <laughs> but it's, it's so, um, when, when all of us are in touch with the community at that level, we, we create a better living environment for everybody. So thank you so much. Best wishes on your new position moving forward. And um, I just wanna say uh, again, special thanks and many congratulations for an award well deserved. Thank you. Uh, sure, I, I would echo, I would echo the same comments. Congratulations! It's a job well done. Uh, THPRD is not in my district. Uh, I don't have any part of it. I have mainly city districts uh, and uh, <laughs> parks. But uh, you guys, yeah, look at you two guys. Uh, <laughs> I, I would attest that all I've seen and witnessed is you guys do a great job. Kathy, I don't think you should have stuck Bruce with all the names tonight. That's always <laughs> dangerous. And Bruce, the only difficulty of your presentation is I remember when you got the award. And so that makes us both old. And I don't like to hear that. So you should have said 2018 or something more attractive. Than what well, I think it makes us survivors is what it makes us. I don't like that either, but thank you. <laughs> but anyway, congratulations to everybody. Well, I joined my colleagues, whoops, yep, I'm on. I joined my colleagues in being very thankful uh, for the work that the Committee for Community Involvement uh, has put into this to uh, solicit applications and to give each mm -hmm. and every one of them thoughtful consideration. Yes, THPRD's Visioning Task Force is in very good company. Uh, but it's also a true award winner as well. So congratulations to you. Thank you for contributing your time and energy to making our community better. And we as a county commission uh, acknowledged last year as we formed as a new commission, we identified that our own strategic plan is out of date. And we recognize that we're going to have to put together a multi-year, multi-pronged approach uh, that includes the community. And so your example shows us how we can go about setting up and empowering our community members. And I know our, our uh, chief administrative officer, Tanya Angie, has a lot of experience in this as well that she brings to us. And so we are looking forward uh, to the future for all of us. But one thing that 
uh, I appreciated, I should say, reviewing the plan, uh, but also the fact that you included a section, moving the vision into action. So it wasn't enough to just define the vision, but how, how is it going to be put into practice and for the vision to be realized? So thank you for making sure that was part of it. And I know as one member of our commission, I'm going to want to learn more about how the task force engaged the THPRD board of directors so I can understand another exemplary uh, example for how we might do our job well for our project ahead. So without further ado, if we were in person, we would get to do this and take a picture. Yeah. So I guess I need you all to put on your best smiles and I'll put up my vision action plan prop here. Is everybody ready? Smile. There we go. I'll be sure to, uh, to get that to you so we can, we can give it some more recognition. Okay, was there anything else on this presentation? I just wanna say virtual hugs and congratulations. And there, Thank you and there is a, a physical plaque that will be delivered. So oh, even though we're in virtual times, there is an actual award to share. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you, Amanda, Thank you. For, for working with the Committee for Community Involvement and congratulations to all of you at THPRD. And thank you for joining us tonight. It's wonderful to see you as I've been sequestered in this room all day. <laughs> Take good care, stay healthy. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Okay, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. Or does anyone need to interrupt me with anything? No, okay. Uh, we'll move on to our next presentation, a COVID-19 update. And I know we've got some new things going on and lots to learn because we have a super awesome public health team. So looks like we're welcoming back Marty Kyle, our Director of Health and Human Services. Oh, there she is. Hi, Marty. Hello, good evening, Chair Harrington and board. Um, we do have quite a bit to cover tonight, but I also know that you're really um, probably tired of being on Zoom today. So, Don't rush um, it, this is really I, important. Yeah, I will rush it, but um, um, we'll try to get through it for you. So, okay, next slide, please. So as normal, I'm starting with the numbers. Um, I'll go pretty quickly on this because we all know that the numbers are going in the wrong direction. Um, as of yesterday, our state had reported cumulative 57,646 cases of COVID-19. That puts us at a case rate um, statewide of 1,297, almost 1,300 per 100,000 with 765 um, deaths and an increasing hospitalization rate. I, I believe last week when I talked to you, the, the seven day average was 12 and we're up to 23 now. Next slide, please. So um, these are our Washington County numbers. And what I really wanna point out here is that you'll see from uh, November 2nd to this week, we've seen a 27% increase just in one week of cases. And some a couple of late breaking um, points I wanna make, and we can, we can move to the next slide because you can see the numbers there. Um, I, I think this is really stark. You, you've seen this slide before. This is what we refer to as our epi curve or epidemiologic curve. Um, but what goes along with this is a couple of um, things that I want you to know. So one is um, the healthcare system is starting to struggle. Um, and that, that includes our emergency medical system of care. Um, what we've learned in the last week is that they're struggling with especially non-emergency um, ambulance. So not the 911 ambulances, but um, non-emergency. Um, those are the, the vehicles that take people from maybe the hospital to a long-term care center 
or to a doctor's appointment when they need that medical transportation. And this is happening across the region. And so we're working with Multnomah County in particular um, to look at how we can reduce some of the staffing requirements because right now there's a requirement that the ambulance must be staffed with a licensed um, um, to practice EMT level. And so we're looking to um, be able to reduce that maybe to um, basic first aid. The other thing is that we're hearing um, today, this is just from today, that the metro region only had a small number of open ICU beds. All the major healthcare providers are at maximum capacity for testing um, as well, and testing results are now being delayed five to seven days, which we've talked an awful lot about um, how, um, how difficult that makes our job in um, finding cases early and getting people isolated and quarantined. Um, so those are a couple of late breaking um, pieces of data that I wanted to share with you um, that have happened since um, doing these slides. So next slide. So the other thing that I wanted to just bring back to your attention, I know we've talked about this a lot since um, March actually, um, but we do continue to see a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on our Latinx population. And just as a reminder, this disproportionate impact and the cost of lives and quality of life for racially and ethnically diverse communities um, from COVID-19 is, is really serving as a tragic and reoccurring reminder of the longstanding inequities that exist in times of emergency, it exists all of the time and in particular in times of emergency and crisis. This is evidenced across the nation um, where non-white residents have suffered significantly higher rates of illness, hospitalization, and death. And our experience in Washington County, as you can see, is mirrored in these national trends. This reaffirms that understanding that these populations remain especially impacted and vulnerable in the times of crisis and brings to light the structural inequalities and challenges such as access to healthcare, education, food, and housing. Um, what we're finding is these populations are really struggling. They, they can't stay home and say, stay safe like many of us can. They can't do their jobs on Zoom um, or by telecommuting. They're, they're the folks that are really making sure that we have food on our table. They're often taking care of our parents and our grandparents and assisted living situations, working in factories and um, other um, businesses that really have difficulty social distancing and um, not being able to stay home. So I just wanted to remind you of that disparity. Next slide. So um, what are we doing um, to address this impact? And um, you can see, and, and we um, sent a communication update today and we'll be sending that weekly again. But um, we were, as you remember, the first county to announce this disparity and start working on culturally sensitive material. We worked with uh, Salud, uh, Central Cultural, we worked with Virginia Garcia, um, made visits out to the um, camps during the migrant season, um, really worked with those community-based organizations to trans-create um, Spanish language material, um, Facebook material, um, uh, created a, a coronavirus webpage, made visits. We can go to the next slide. Um, really tailoring the messages. We did hire um, some culturally competent contractors to produce social media messages, graphics, and videos. So such as the contact tracing video was um, created in Spanish so that we could help our Spanish language um, community members understand, well, what happens when you're called and how does contact tracing work? Um, also, um, we've hired some experts in social media um, to help us with uh, Facebook Live interviews and uh, memes and social broadcasting campaigns that have reached over 2 million Spanish speakers. And then finally, next slide. 
We also have been working hard to address the essential needs. So especially for folks that are in isolation or quarantine, um, really helping to assure that they had their rents, utility um, paid, that there were groceries for family members and that they were well supported in isolation and quarantine. Um, for other folks, we often, when we were delivering educational material and um, masks, we also delivered food um, and other incentives to really help the community come together and talk about what was happening. Um, and a lot of that was done in partnership, again, with our culturally um, specific um, CBOs in this area. And then just as a reminder that um, over 80% of our um, uh, disease investigators and contact tracers are um, bilingual, sorry, um, and 65% uh, speak Spanish. So just as a reminder that we, um, OPHI did a great job of um, helping us to find bilingual bicultural staff. And, and that's um, mostly Spanish speaking, but um, many other cultures as well. Okay, so moving on, um, I really had hoped um, by tonight to have a graphic that um, really helped to show what the new metrics are going to be, but um, the governor's office and OHA are working on new metrics that will replace the phase two readiness and the watch list. So you might have noticed in my data slides that we didn't have the phase two readiness or the watch list um, slides, and that's because they're being replaced and because you would have seen a lot of red, and that just makes us sad, even though it's the truth. <laughs> so um, what's what we think is going to be helpful in these new metrics is that they're aligned with the school metrics. So for example, um, Washington County would be in what they call the extreme risk category right now, which is 200 um, or 200 cases per 100,000 or higher. And we have, we've been there for um, the last week. Um, and we also think that these metrics um, are gonna be, so they're related to both disease rates, like I just said, 200 per 100,000 is the extreme risk, and then they're titrated down. Um, and it matches what you see in the um, school, in-person school um, metrics. And then also um, continuing to look at testing and test positivity. So we think that these metrics will be more helpful in helping us to make um, informed community decisions about um, how we can um, behave um, and what businesses um, can be open. So, um, the other thing is, is that um, we've had to make some um, changes in our public health communication to really um, help people to understand and amplify the governor's um, message around what this freeze means. So providing some stay at home um, information, um, really asking people to avoid any, un any unessential unnecessary trips. So other than work, healthcare, grocery stores, really asking people to avoid trips and limiting social gathering to six or fewer and no more than two households. And we know that this is incredibly difficult, especially as we approach Thanksgiving. Um, but I think it's really, it's important to remember Thanksgiving is important of a tradition that is for many of us and many of our families. It's one day and having a healthy family um, can last many, 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 many years to come. And so we're asking you to make this sacrifice this year and really think about um, safe Thanksgiving plans, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Also, the governor ordered um, food as um, back to curbside takeout only. Um, indoor, outdoor dining um, is closed and gyms are closed. People are asked, everyone is asked, and I think I've been saying this for a few months, if you're outside of your house, please wear a mask if you cannot maintain complete and total six foot distance. But the governor's now ordered that when we're indoors, we're outdoors. If we're around others, we need to wear a mask. Then the other um, important message, public health, even in Washington County, 
we're seeing over 100 new cases per day. And so we have had to change our approach, especially in the metro area. So um, Washington County and Multnomah County in particular, and Clackamas County, we just are over capacity. Testing um, and results are taking longer. So we just asking people, if you're waiting on test results, just stay home, please stay home. If you test positive, don't wait for us to call, isolate yourself from others and stay home and take steps to prevent transmission in, home, in your own home. And we do have videos, both in English and Spanish on our webpage um, to help with that. And then we're asking folks to please notify your close contacts and ask them to self quarantine. We all know what to do now. If we test positive, we need to isolate ourselves. We need to stay home. We need to protect others in our household, our friends, and our coworkers. And we need to let people know right away because the public health system is over capacity and you may not get that call soon. So go ahead and do what we've been talking about all these months. Okay, so the next slide, please. So high, higher caseloads um, have changed our priorities. I've talked a little bit about this. We are going to have to focus on the most high priority, high risk um, outbreaks. So, for example, outbreaks in assisted living nursing homes. Um, we're also going to have to prioritize um, all the assistance that we give to high risk facilities like long term care, congregate housing, jails, shelters, manufacturing and process processing. Those are the um, the businesses where we're seeing the most risk. We're gonna end um, daily monitor to free up case interviewers and contact tracers for those highest risk cases. And we're gonna refer lower risk individuals and work settings to the 211 system for general education and support. So we will, we will not be notifying all work sites anymore if there's a case identified in their work site, unless it's high risk, um, such as I, I've mentioned the long-term care congregate setting or high risk settings. Okay, so the new school metrics and mostly I just wanted to remind you of what the metrics are. Um, Washington County is in that red distance learning. We, our case rate is higher than 200 per 100,000. Um, and our, our um, testing as you saw is also high. Um, but what's kind of also nice about this is these, these metrics are going to match um, some of the new metrics that OHA is working on that will help guide um, total reopening for our county. So next slide, just to show you where we are. Um, and as you can see, our um, Washington County, um, our case rate is currently 260. So that's quite a jump from the 189, which was when we were first put in the um, two week pause um, before the governor's freeze order. And you can see that we also, our test positivity is above that 10%. Um, Clackamas County is in really the same, same place as us, as well as Multnomah County. So um, I think that you know, you've heard us say that we do anticipate that our um, freeze is with numbers like this, case rates this high are likely to, to last more than the two weeks. Okay, next slide. So just also wanted to let you know, this is probably not a surprise, but we've had a 50% increase in the past week in um, families that were supporting in isolation and quarantine. We've supported over 1,685 families, households. Um, and in just the past week, we had 163 um, households that we've been supporting in isolation and quarantine. And the way that we do that is really strong partnerships with our community-based organizations. So you can see uh, Central Cultural, Families in Ascension, ERCO, and 20 other community-based um, organizations have contracts and agreements with Washington County um, and with the Oregon Health Authority to really help us to support these families. Because again, when the entire family is under isolation or quarantine orders, people aren't working, 
it's difficult to pay rent, to get food, um, utilities, all of those essential needs need to be met. Um, and we need to check in on them, see how they're doing emotionally, physically, help them um, get to um, doctor's offices if they need to do that, con or contact with their doctor if they need to do that. Okay, so um, I, I went over this a bit earlier, but um, this is really the full list of what's required in the governor's new um, freeze order. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to read this. This is available for the public on our website. You all have seen this multiple times, um, and it'll be available um, up on this presentation that, that folks can get through the, um, through the um, packet that's online. Um, but I just wanted to have it all there in case we want it to be wherever people go and look so that they're able to find this. So if they look for it on this packet, if they look for it on our webpage, on the county webpage that they'll be able to find um, what these new orders are. The other thing that uh, got a little bit, next slide please, that was a little bit more quiet, I think because of the freeze orders is um, the governor, um, along with the governors of California and Washington state have ordered a 14 day self quarantine when you're entering their state from another um, state or an international visit. And so what that means is if it's non-essential travel that they're asking you to self-quarantine for 14 days when you return. Um, it does not include essential um, business or health travel. So for example, if you live in Vancouver and you work in Washington County um, and you're not able to telecommute, you can come back and forth to work. Um, just, to, just as an example, but it really is trying to get people, again, to avoid non-essential business or social traveling. Okay, and then just quick updates on our um, programs. So there was a problem with the uh, uh, HMIS system um, on Monday and Tuesday, and so I don't have numbers for you but we do still have family promise operating and sheltering folks in hotels. Um, the safe sleeping village, um, we've now transferred everyone from there to either winter shelters or to the respite center. Um, the RV camping, RV safe sleeping village is still operating. Um, and the great news is, is that our winter shelters have opened. They opened on Monday. And um, just that quick, just on Monday, the four shelter sites were near capacity, which is 120 beds, and we already have 30 people um, on waiting lists. So still a great need out there. Next slide. The respite shelter, um, we still have the 36 folks that I talked about from the Safe Sleeping Village on the what we're calling the West Wing of the respite shelter. Um, and then we do have um, five COVID impacted um, individuals on the east wing of the COVID um, respite shelter. Next slide, uh, childcare and school age learning. So um, we've now had 291 applications that have been completed, 318 awards, and we have awarded uh, $3.18 million um, to our childcare providers, which is great, and applications continue to come in. And um, the good news for the school districts is all the school districts, as I've been reporting, are participating. And I think that the, the latest information this week is that they all anticipate spending the full um, approved amount um, because there's great need out there and they're doing really good work. So we're excited about um, parents being able to access that support. All right, Thanksgiving. <laughs> this is a, a sad topic for many of us, um, but again, you know, please think about it as really an opportunity to take care of the people that you love and to keep them safe and healthy. So we're asking people to only share meals with people in your immediate household. Um, I did see that Zoom, which we're using tonight, 
has on Thanksgiving Day um, extended that um, they won't um, keep people to that 40 minute limit. So that's a great opportunity. I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom my family in Arizona. Um, I, I don't think I'll do 40 minutes because I'm not sure I could do that, but um, definitely mm -hmm. it'll be an opportunity to pass that laptop and uh, uh, tablet around and say hello to my parents and my brothers and sisters and nieces. Um, all it'll be uh, serial zooms because they're all having their own household events. So I'll have to make multiple calls this year, um, but also um, just in general limit social gatherings to no more than six people for no more than two households. And um, really asking people, if you do have a second household for Thanksgiving or for any other gatherings that if you're indoors to please ask people, even though you're, even though you're family, where to wear your mask when you're indoors. And um, as hard as it is, we know Black Friday and all those shopping traditions are coming up, but really, really important to avoid crowded malls and consider shopping online. And I keep thinking about, maybe I don't need to show this, but these, these activities, we, I mean, we had some good news this week about vaccines and uh, that the horizon looks really great, that there's some, some effective vaccines on our, on our near horizon. But to get us there, we need to keep doing these things. And um, we might even want to think about doubling down on these. If you haven't done it already, please get your flu shot. And we've stressed this over and over and over, wear your face covering. Um, it, it is, you know, for some people, it's annoying. They don't want to do it. But let me tell you, as a nurse, um, it's been a long, long time since I worked in a hospital. But it is also really, really uncomfortable and annoying to be on a ventilator or to be in the intensive care unit. Um, so I'm asking you, please avoid that for yourself and your family. Wear that face covering when you're with other people. Maintain that physical distance. We always tell you to wash your hands in public health. Um, and again, avoid those big social gatherings. And I, with that, if there's any questions or comments, I am happy to take them. Commissioner Adams, any comments? Good morning, this is Roy. The, the only uh, the only question I have that I keep getting asked, and I don't have a question for it uh, or an answer for it, I should say, is why not take the vulnerable groups, those in certain age groups and those with health conditions, and put those folks uh, in in the quarantine, and then try to make the a normal uh, accommodations of masks, social distancing, washing hands, everything you just said, get your flu shots. Um, I, I don't have a great answer for that. I mean, that's that's a common question. And I would have asked you at the work session today, we didn't have this on, so. Yeah, I, I think that the, the, um, the, the biggest, the most important answer to that is those vulnerable populations often need caretaking because they're in our assisted living centers or they need food delivered to their homes or um, they need groceries. And if the rest of us are out running around and getting infected, even though maybe we don't get as sick, then we're gonna go and work in those, those sites, whether it's an assisted living center or a grocery store where uh, an older person is trying to shop, you just, we're, we're too integrated of a society. And I will say that the governor's approach to the freeze um, was really based more this time, um, instead of sort of this blanket, everything's closed. It really was based on where are we seeing risk? Where are we seeing cases? And there was a lot of emphasis on social gatherings or parties, uh, wedding parties, graduation, uh, birthdays, uh, every kind of celebration you, any family can imagine. Um, and in restaurants and bars where people 
can't wear a mask because you can't eat and drink with a mask on. Those are all places where people are vulnerable. Um, so I think that that's the answer is that you really can't, we don't have, and I mean, this is a metaphor, not, I'm not saying that you were suggesting this, but we don't have an isolated island that we can put high risk people on that they would never be exposed um, to other people. There's just too much integration in our society. I don't know if that helps, but. I just say thank you for those asking the question that, uh, that the experts talking. So. I'd like to thank you, Marnie, for your presentation today and for always keeping all of us uh, informed and uh, having the right information. I, I do want to uh, let people know that the governor today announced a $55 million uh, pot of money that's going to be distributed to throughout the state for uh, business recovery purposes. We'll be working with the business recovery group to determine you know, how we can work with that pot of money in relationship to the other money that we're, we're dealing with. But this is a, it is a difficult time. Your team is doing a great job and now it's our job to keep doing the right thing. And as leaders to keep demonstrating that we intend to follow the guidelines of the governor. So, and I've heard that, and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very positive that I'm a member of a commission that supports the actions that we need to take to keep mm -hmm. everybody safe. So thank you to uh, you, Marnie, but also thank you to my fellow commissioners for taking this seriously and acting in the best interest of the public. Thank you. I I have to say I feel very fortunate too um, in seeing you know being on national um, public health um, lists and communication and I do feel really fortunate to have so much support from county admin here in Washington County and from you all as boards um, you you care about the science even though it's really really tough sometimes um, you you guys really are listening and care. So we, we all appreciate that. All of our public health colleagues appreciate you all. You know, the other, the other quick thing I wanted to say is that I think it's interesting to look at our neighbor to the north, the state of Washington, and the steps that their governor has taken. In, in, in many cases, they're, they're more extreme than ours, but their situation it looks like is more extreme than ours. So I'm I'm proud of our Pacific Northwest leadership in trying to dial to what the situation is and where the situation is so we're effective in the uh, restrictions that we're putting in place. Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't on mute. I hope I wasn't making too, too much noise here. Uh, so Marty, I join my colleagues in being very thankful and appreciative of the information that you continue to bring forward to us and that your team of professional health experts uh, does the work that you do to support our community members to continue to practice uh, new ideas. You're always open to new ideas for how you can serve as many people who are in need uh, and to continue to have open eyes and open ears to all of that. Yes, we absolutely stand with you, beside you, behind you, uh, and with uh, our CAO, making sure that we provide you with the resource, resources or just the support needed to do the public's good. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. And, um, you know, I appreciate the work that you all have been doing with the state so that you're able to make more informed community-based decisions. Boy, we're really relying upon you guys to, to do what's right for the everyone's public health. Uh, I'm one of those people that when uh, I really internalized the, the pause impact. And when we first learned that the freeze was coming, uh, worked with 
with the CAO to say, yep, it's time for us to go virtual 100%. And I'm the person who you have to take kicking and screaming out of the <laughs> office and to go entirely virtual. So, uh, you know, I know this is hard. Commissioner Trees and I were talking earlier today and she was reminding me, yes, it feels hard because it is hard. Okay. Uh, but we will get through this. We'll we'll get through it with with grace, with humor, with tenacity. This virus is not going to take us down, people. We've got this. We can do this. Uh, I appreciate that Kaiser Permanente is running TV ads uh, with nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, every one of the kind of skills that they have that's involved with caring for us to ask us the simple, to make the simple request. Mayor, wear your mask, mm -hmm. do these smart things. I know I don't wanna be a statistic. I don't wanna know what it's like to be put on a respirator, thank you very much. Um, so we're count on us to do our part. Uh, and along the way, you know, and your team knows that you can ask us to do other things that you think are smart and we're just gonna do them. So thank you. I hope that you will have a fun Thanksgiving holiday with you and your family and that your team will get at least a one day break from all the, the intensity that they've been enduring for eight months straight. Yep. Thank you. I, I hope so. Thank you. Um, one thing I you reminded me is I, I wanted to share with you that I had, um, I'm really um, grateful that we have Latricia Tillman as, as part of our team now. And uh, she and Amanda and um, my uh, Health and Human Services PIOs and Philip are all getting together and really trying to come up with some new ideas. And Trisha brings a really fresh perspective and some new ideas and how we can address the Latinx disparity. And um, we're planning on um, presenting together, um, hopefully at the next board meeting so that we can share um, some of the great ideas that um, everybody collectively is coming up with. So it's great to have some some fresh new ideas. And, and it, it, Marty, of all your presentation was powerful, but for me, the most powerful or piece was the disparity between the Latinx community and the and the uh, the white community in terms of the degree of um, the percentage of people that get this disease. And I, I I'm thankful that you're you're getting to the bottom of this. I hope we're all working together with the other organization, Central Cultural, uh, Adelante, everybody, and I'm certain you are, to make sure that, that we're doing our part in pushing down on that situation and, you know, and, and taking the, some time to look at, okay, what are the real causes of that disparity? And what can we learn from that disparity? And how can we incorporate that into our future without a pandemic? What does it mean without a pandemic to have that type of disparity? So, so there, is, there is going to be a future without a pandemic. And I want to make sure that we're taking our lessons learned for all of our community forward. Ms. Angie, did you have any comments you wanted to add? Because you've been helping spearhead and support our public health teams and helping pull all of our PIO experts together. Uh, thank you, Chair Harrington. Uh, commissioners, I think Marnie always hits the mark um, every board uh, meeting. So I will just share gratitude and appreciation for the organization as well. Um, moving quickly from a pause to a freeze. We have really shifted operations, focusing on still um, allowing government services to continue through online, through phone, and some appointments um, as well. We know that these changes are an impact on the community. It is incredibly important um, that we keep our community safe and also we keep our employees safe. 
during these times. So we are um, taking those measures as well. And that's all I have. Thank you. Well, I know I will try and do my part to encourage our two colleagues when they return home to help support them to stay at home for those 14 days uh, because it will serve our whole community better uh, if, if we're able to uh, encourage them to do so. So we're all set up. This is our first 100% virtual meeting. So we know how it's done now. So great. Well, thank you again, Marnie, uh, and to your team as well. Terrific. Well, we'll move on then to the next section of our agenda, boards and commissions. We have a proposal to appoint a planning commissioner for the district three position. Uh, do we have Stephen Roberts? There he is. Hi, Stephen. Hello, how are you? Just fine. Did you want Great. to say anything about this or do you want me to just summarize it? I, if you'd like to, uh, we also have Todd Borkowitz on uh, standby. If you'd like to staff report, we're happy to do that. And yeah, that's fine. Board. If you're here, great. Best to hear from staff. All right. Okay. All right. You can go ahead, Todd. Oh, you're on Oops, mute. You're on mute. <laughs> You think I would have this down by now. So, um, hello, Chair Harrington and Commissioners. Um, I'm Todd Borkowitz, Associate Planner with Land Use and Transportation. And uh, we're here today to request um, appointment on a midterm vacancy for Planning Commission District 3. Uh, the appointment would be effective immediately due to resignation of former Planning Commissioner Bart Dixon. The seat represents Commission District 3. Uh, the term expires on January 31st. 2024, and the appointee would be eligible to serve one additional term, uh, one additional four-year term. Uh, the county administrative office solicited applic applications for membership, and the county staff interviewed two eligible candidates for District 3, Blake Dye and Edward Kimmy. The board discussed these candidates in the October 20th work session and communicated its interest in appointing Blake Dye. We therefore recommend appointment of Blake Dye to the vacant planning commission position effective immediately. Thank you. So move, Madam Chair. Second. We have a motion and a second to appoint Blake Dye to the vacant planning commission position representing district three for a term ending on January 31st, 2024. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries three to zero. Thank you very I, much. Uh, Chair, uh, I think that we may have uh, Mr. Dye in our participant uh, list today. So I just want to extend a thank you for your willingness to serve on the planning commission. So. Blake, would you like to say hello? Yes. If you want to turn your camera on or Once anything. Once I just promoted him up. And I would note uh, Blake's been serving on the Urban Road Maintenance District Advisory Committee for us. There he is. Hi. Hi, Blake. Hi, thank you. I, it said rejoining and it just started spitting. So. <laughs> Thanks so much for um, this appointment. It has been um, so exciting to work with the um, planning team in another capacity. Um, and I'll be moving on from ERMDAC to serve in this capacity. And it's just great to represent my district and to be you know, so engaged with the Washington County staff and team. So thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you too. We really appreciate all of the contributions of time and expertise that you've been giving us here in Washington County. And we look forward to more. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, I'll do my part. Thanks, Blake. Right. Thank, Thank you, you know, Blake. I'm the commissioner in that district, so I'm pleased to, uh, to nominate you. And I, I, I know your work from other committees, you're gonna do a great job, so. Mr. Rogers, thank you so much. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Trees, for noticing. <laughs> I appreciate that. Great. Uh, so next, we're going to move on to public hearings and continue with land use and transportation. Woohoo! First, we have a public hearing to legalize a portion of Southwest Mountain Home Road as County Road 3327. And so, Madam Chair. There's Stacy Shetler. Way to go. Yep, Thank you, I'm gonna, Stephen. I'm going to have Stacy give a staff report, and then Stacy and John Kidd are available if you have any questions. Great. Thank you, Chair Harrington. Commissioners, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Excellent. For the record, I'm Stacy Shetler, County Engineer with Land Use and Transportation. Before you today is the matter of legalizing a portion of Mountain Home Road, County Road number 3327. If this legalization seems familiar, it's because your board legalized a different portion of Mountain Home Road, County Road 3326, last month on October 20th. Mountain Home Road runs south of the Shoals community between Oregon Route 219 and the Yamhill County line. The road is owned and maintained by Washington County and there is uncertainty as to the location of a portion of the legal roadway south of Courtney Road to the Yamhill County line. This uncertainty was realized as a result of a recent paving project on Mountain Home Road. Research and analysis of the record documents along with survey field work concludes that a portion of the legal right-of-way cannot be accurately surveyed and that a portion of the record county road notes do not conform to the traveled roadway. The portion of Mountain Home Road that is being proposed to be legalized was originally established as a county road in the year 1913. And based upon maintenance records, survey records, fences, and other features in the area, this road has been traveled in its current location for over 100 years. Oregon Revised Statute 368.201 provides that a county governing body may initiate proceedings to legalize a county road if the location of the road cannot be accurately determined due to either numerous alterations of the road, a defective survey of the road, or adjacent property, or if the road has traveled and used for 10 years or more does not conform to the location of the road described in the county records. This roadway meets the criteria for legalization. There are no permanent structures that predate the traveled alignment of the road in the proposed right-of-way. The adjacent property owners were notified per the statute and to our knowledge, there's no opposition to the legalization. The residents that did reach out before this hearing were primarily concerned that this legalization was a precursor to a larger capital project that would widen the road and increase traffic. Staff communicated that there is not a planned capital project identified for this road at this time, and that this legalization is a cleanup and clarification of survey records. Based on the foregoing facts, staff requests your board first conduct the public hearing and second approve the resolution and order. This concludes the staff report and I can take questions at this time. Uh, Commissioners, any questions? No? Okay. Well, looks like it's time to open a public hearing. I just realized I did not bring a gavel home, so I'll knock on wood. I hereby open a public hearing. Mr. Moss, do we have anyone signed up to testify during this public hearing? We do not, Madam Chair. Okay. Our building is closed, right? So there's nobody in the room? There is okay. one, but he has no, uh, he doesn't have any test testimony for you guys. Okay. So I'll knock on wood again and close today's public hearing. No further question to action. We have a motion second. to adopt a resolution. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion to adopt the resolution and order legalizing a portion of Southwest Mountain Home Road as a county road. Uh, and this legalization will become final at the filing of the proposed record of survey in the county surveyor office. All those in favor of this action, please vote by saying aye. aye. Uh, any opposed? The motion carries unanimously three to zero. 
Thank you very much team for making sure that the road that we've been traveling on for over 107 odd years is a fully legalized road. Thank you. The road has, doesn't seem to have any problem with this. All right, we're gonna move on to another public hearing from the Urban Road Maintenance District. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is going to be a second reading. Do we have a motion to read this? By, it's not an, yes, it is an ordinance. Do we need to have a motion to read it by title only? Yes. Okay. Come on. Second. We have a motion and a second to read by title only. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously three to zero. Take it away, Mr. Rapplier. Okay, ordinance number four related to the expansion of the neighborhood streets program eligibility to residential collectors and other minor amendments. Thank you. Staff report. So Madam Chair, I'm gonna to ask Todd Watkins to just give a brief staff report. And this is actually, I wanted to note, this is a uh, sort of a tandem item to uh, number 6C under the action agenda. And the purpose of amending the armed ordinance primarily is to facilitate the expansion of the neighborhood streets program. Item 6C will be adoption of an updated criteria and policy for neighborhood streets program. So take it away, Todd. Thanks, Stephen. Chair Harrington. Board members, um, I do want to just take a moment uh, to go back to a previous agenda item and uh, thank Blake Dye for his service on Ermdac. He's done a great job and to be sorely missed, but we're glad that he's able to continue his service on the Planning Commission. So congratulations, Blake, for that. Um, we have a presentation tonight to go over a brief summary of the progress of the um, proposed um, ordinance number four amendment to the earned ordinance. So move on to the first slide, please, or second slide. So to give you a little bit of history about how we got here, um, we have been to your board um, several times on this. Uh, a lifetime ago, pre-COVID, we were actually at your board in the building face-to-face -to, -face, um, to give you a briefing during a work session back in February. And then we have provided a couple of other briefings more recently um, in October. And then we had the first reading back in November, earlier in November. Next slide, please. So this is earned ordinance number four. Uh, the first one uh, actually adopted um, earned as a service district. And that was back in 1988. We had the first expansion of the ordinance in 2001 when the neighborhood streets program was created. And then uh, more recently, we had the ERM ordinance number three, which um, allowed us to expend um, ERM funds for the bike and pedestrian safety improvement projects. Next slide, please, thank you. So what this does is it does expand that existing neighborhood streets program to include the residential collectors um, it enables the funding for those traffic coming projects. Um, and then also there were a few minor cleanups that need to occur within the ordinance text. So we wanted to take advantage of this, uh, this time to do that. Next slide, please. So we recommend that you do adopt the staff recommendation for um, adopting the ordinance. And as Stephen alluded to, there will be um, another subsequent action item tonight that will adopt uh, the policy and procedures for that um, program if you um, do go ahead and adopt this ordinance. And with that, I will take any questions if you have any. Commissioners, any questions? I know oh. we had a, a work session on this previously, so I'm not seeing any questions today, Mr. Watkins. So, with that, uh, we've had the second reading and now we need to hold our first public hearing. Uh, I don't need to take a motion for that, do I? You do not, Madam Chair. Thanks, I'm just always trying to check I do the procedure right. Okay, with that, we'll open tonight's public hearing. Mr. Moss, is there anyone who has signed up to testify during this public hearing tonight? We do not have anyone signed up, Madam Chair. And nobody in the room? Uh, okay. We have no one in the room. 
Okay, thank you. With that, I close the public hearing. Uh, what are, let's see, it is an ordinance, but we need to see if we have a motion to adopt this ordinance first, right? Before we do the roll call. That's correct. Move to adopt. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Board Clerk, could you please call the roll? Yes, I can, Madam Chair. Commissioner Treese? Yes. Commissioner Rogers? Aye. Chair Harrington? Yes. Terrific. And er, er, you, you are MD, ermed. Ordinance number four hereby passes unanimously three to zero. Thank you very much, team. Thank you. Next, we move on from public hearings to our action items. And the first one is with Clean Water Services to conduct the first reading of an ordinance. Let's see. Move, move we read by title only. Thank you. Second. Wonderful, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of reading the ordinance by title only, please vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously three to zero. Mr. Linder. Ordinance 42, an ordinance prescribing rules governing the discharge of non-domestic waste to the publicly owned treatment works of clean water services, amending ordinance 27 and repealing resolution and order 09-01. Do we need to say the next part about continuing for a second reading? Uh, that's our that's our action request. Okay. I had moved for the requested action, Madam Chair. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of continuing, continuing December one, yeah. Well, do we have a staff report now? We uh, normally, Madam Chair, yes, you would have the staff report and then you would take action on the recommendation. Okay. So let's hold the motion and the second and okay. go to the staff report. Thank you, Chair Harrington. This is Diane Taniguchi Dennis, uh, Chief Executive Officer for Clean Water Services. Today we have Joy Ramirez, who will be giving our staff report on the non domestic uh, waste ordinance for us this evening. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Madam Chair Harrington and members of the board. Bob Baumgartner, Roger Diltz, and I are here to give a brief overview for the first reading of the non-domestic waste ordinance. Next slide, please. The pretreatment program regulates and provides oversight for a large variety of non-domestic waste discharges to the sanitary sewer. Some of the industries due to the type of industrial activity, such as metal finishers, or electrical component manufacturers are required to be regulated under the federal rule. Additionally, the, additionally to the federal program, Environmental Services implements a local program. This local program provides over, oversight for hauled waste, unregulated pollutants, and also cost recovery from industries that discharge high strength waste. To provide additional protection for the sewage, excuse me, for the sewage treatment plants, workers, public health and safety, and environmental protection. Next slide, please. The new non-domestic waste ordinance continues to provide the public health for our system and for the environment. We have additional protection from damages caused by discharges within the systems and of the treatment plants. And it also consolidates over 40 years of a 40 year old program of regulations to provide clarity, streamlining, so that we have um, a clear expectation of what the non domestic waste ordinance is and how to implement it. It also provides increased transparency for the, for the district, the users, and expectations of our pretreatment program. Next slide, please. 
we came to the board back in, I believe it was, oh, it's this year's gone by way too fast. So back in, I believe it was January or March, it was early this year. I'm sorry if I can't recall the date off the top of my head. And we asked the board to charge CWAC to lead the stakeholder outreach. Part of this process was we took the draft that we had for the non-domestic waste or ordinance, and we reached out to community organizations, developers, the local government, environmental, the environmental community, and also the industries that we regulate. Next slide, please. Oh, I'll go back one slide, please. <laughs> oh, thank you. So during this outreach, I just want to touch, we did receive feedback from our industries and from some stakeholders, including um, the implementer, the co-implementers or the fellow cities. And we made those in adjusts to the non-domestic waste ordinance for their input. Next slide, please. So this is where we're currently at. This is a timeline very clearly of this long process that we've been on. And I think again, Roger, for all the help as we've worked through this together um, to provide this non the language for the non-domestic waste ordinance. With that, I would like to thank you. And if there is any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. Commissioners, do you have any questions? No, thank you. No, thanks. Okay. Well, we already have a motion and a second to continue uh, for the second reading and first public hearing at our next meeting, December 1st, 2020. So all those in favor of this motion, please vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously three to zero. So we look forward to this coming back to us at our meeting on Tuesday, December 1st. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I know we have another action item, a couple of them. Uh, one of them goes back to land use, wait a minute. Yes, we're back to health and human services. Uh, with, uh, to declare an emergency related to COVID-19. And I think uh, relative to following our, our previous precedent, Alan, this is, this is one for you. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, this is unfortunately the 15th emergency declaration we're asking you to continue. And uh, there's no expansion of powers and we're uh, asking you to continue the emergency declaration until December 15th, which I believe is your last meeting of the month. So and that's it. It certainly is. So, so Can moved. I ask a question related to this then? Go ahead. Uh, are the time frame that we have for uh, extending this, uh, is it just two weeks at a time now or can we do it for longer? We expanded, we amended the ordinance, if you recall, early on in the COVID to make it for 30 days. We, we thought that would be enough. Oh, good. <laughs> That way it'll bridge us over the holiday break. We will have enough time over okay. the holidays to, to, re, to revisit it. And, and, okay. yeah, we do, and that's, you're saying that we have, a, we have an opportunity in December to, to extend through the end of the year. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I think Great. Thank you for entertaining that question. And I know Commissioner Rogers has made the motion. Do we have a second on this motion? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Treese. All those in favor of uh, extending the emergency until December 15th, 2020 are under Washington County Code Chapter 8.36 to support response activities to COVID-19. Please vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously three to zero. And we will keep at supporting our communities during this global pandemic. And next, we'll move on to land use and transportation as related to the ordinance we uh, just had earlier. It's time to approve the update to the program policy. And it looks like we have a short staff report. So we'll turn it back to you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Melissa Norman is uh, on deck to do a brief presentation for us. You also received a work session briefing on this recently, but we'd like to just walk you through this just to make sure 
everybody knows what we're up to. Go ahead, Melissa. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. All right, I'll try to make this quick. I know it's towards the end and we're all done being on the computer today. And hopefully uh, this is stuff that you remember at least a little bit. So this is the Neighborhood Streets Program Policy Update. Next slide, please. So this is for primarily residential collectors. It's also to reduce the speed threshold to five miles an hour over the posted speed for them to qualify uh, a prioritization process, a residential traffic calming purchase program, and then TVFNR requested that we make some changes. So next slide, please. So those residential collectors, they are residential properties fronting the street, uh, street segment that's 500 feet in length, posted speed 35 miles an hour or less, an 85th percentile speed of five miles an hour um, over the posted, and then three of the following criteria, on-street parking, no center turn lane, no bike lane, and a minimum 50 fronting properties per mile. So those are the things that we think really make it seem like a residential collector. Next slide, please. So here are some examples. Joss, Johnson, Jameson, we do cover other letters in the alphabet, <laughs> but here's some uh, pictures to give you a good idea of what they look like. I'm sure you can all think of some in your areas that would qualify as well. Next slide, please. So the prioritization process, residential collectors, uh, we're going with the greatest number of criteria met, and this is that same qualifying criteria. And then uh, if we have some that have the same number of qualifying criteria, we'd look at speed differential. So between the posted um, and the 85th, and then when that's tied, we'll go with the highest traffic volume. So the roads that have more cars are driving on them. Next slide, please. So for locals and neighborhood routes, this is really just mirroring the same process. Um, so those qualifying criteria and then speed and then traffic volume again. And this is pretty similar to what we're already doing. It's just written to make it easier for everybody to understand. Next slide, please. So uh, if you may or may not remember, we started this way back with a February 4th briefing uh, where you asked us to look into these, uh, reducing that seven mile an hour that we currently use to five miles an hour over the speed limit. It has an increase of, you know, 20, up to 28, uh, collectors from the 24 that it previously was, so not a big number there. It's a little bit harder to tell on the locals and neighborhood routes um, because we don't just go out and analyze every one of those. They're kind of on a uh, request basis, but we could see a, a re really big jump there. Um, it's going to make, you know, an increased demand for anybody working on the program. That's why we have that prioritization, and we really tried to make it clear so that they could see where they fall in line with everybody else. We could see some projects delayed due to funding or staff limitations because we are not changing the funding for the program. This is very similar to what happened. I'm sure um, if any of you remember the history of the program when it started, we had you know lots of requests come in. I say we, even though that wasn't me at the time. Um, and then they kind of peter off, but we are able to address a lot of these. So I'm hopeful that this is gonna really help us be responsive to public requests. And we've had a lot of people that are really waiting for this to go through. So uh, there were no additional questions after the October 13th briefing. So here's kind of the timeline of where we've been. And we are at the, uh, we'd like to request that you adopt the NSP RNL. Next slide, please. And are there any questions? I just have one. Uh, and that is, I remember it was, it was sometime while I was on the commission, but I can't remember when, although I remember it being in-person testimony from a, a constituent in uh, my area and Commissioner Rogers district. Patrick Eau Claire, uh, down in the Bull Mountain area, uh, concern uh, requesting support for traffic calming. And I, I believe that at that time, his street didn't meet the criteria, not the three criteria for traffic calming, but for the residential collector. 
And so I think with the ordinance we changed and by adopting this, there's uh, some hope there. And I'm wondering, should I reach back to him in, for constituent contact or is that something that LUT might already have up its great and mighty sleeve? We actually have uh, a press release, media release, uh, ready to go that is, uh, I, I read through a copy of it earlier today. Heather has it all ready to be released. I am fairly confident that Mr. Eau Claire will be um, on top of most media releases that go out. If not, he's uh, fairly regular con in, in fairly regular contact with a number of people at the county. So um, he should be aware of this coming through and um, it's Great. on his radar. Perfect. If not, I'm sure we'll hear from him and we can let him know. Yeah. He's just the, the one name that I recall at the moment. So wonderful. Well, so we have a proposal in front of us. What are the wishes of the commission on this resolution and order? Move to adopt. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt the resolution and order to update the neighborhood streets program policy. All those in favor vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously three to zero. Thank you commissioners and thank you staff for being here tonight. Uh, we're on to our final action item for this evening from the County Administrative Office to authorize the use of the electronic board signature. Uh, let's see, do we have anyone on deck for a staff report or should I just describe this and go from there? Uh, I can present the staff report, Madam Chair. Uh, Wonderful, yeah. please do Mr. Moss. Thank you very much. So this is to uh, fully facilitate the use of virtual meetings per the governor's order and in line with our COVID restrictions to authorize uh, myself, the board clerk or alter board clerk to use your electronic signatures to approve all items approved by the board at these board meetings. So just a, a uh, cleanup to make it so we can uh, expeditiously produce the business of the county for our residents. It also has the benefit of a consistent signature, unlike my handwritten one. <laughs> so uh, do we have a motion to authorize this action item? So moved. I want to think about this for a while. <laughs> you know, second. I think I can second it. Second. <laughs> Commissioner Rogers just wants me to go to the office. <laughs> hey, I would welcome that, believe me. <laughs> All those in favor of the, the motion, please vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously three to zero. Thank you, Mr. Moss for bringing that forward. Uh, and that's it for our action agenda. Uh, next, we move on to our second uh, area of oral communications. Do we have anyone signed up for this tonight, Mr. Moss? Uh, we did, Madam Chair, but we do not see them online. So that we concludes our business for tonight for public comment. Well, that's a bummer. We lost somebody. Shoot. Okay, well, board announcements. And I'll start with the standard announcements. Uh, those for our next meeting. Well, looks like uh, after this week, next week we don't have any board meetings. So that leaves us with three work weeks to finish the rest of our county business between now and the end of the year. So the week of our very first week of December that starts on Monday, November 30th, I invite you all to join me on YouTube for my first ever uh, end of the year update a substitute of the uh, State of the County report in this very adventuresome year of 2020. Uh, then we'll meet on Tuesday, December 1st for a work session right here brought to you by Zoom at 8.30 in the morning, followed by our board meeting at 10. Thursday the 3rd, we'll have a round table. Uh, Thursday, December 8th, we'll have a set of meetings, 8.30 work session, 10 o'clock board. 
And then on Tuesday, December 15th, that's an important day. It will be the last meeting, set of meetings for Commissioner Dick Skelton, as well as for Alan Rapelier as a uh, permanent employee of Washington County as our county council. We will take them through a work session at two o'clock and then a board meeting that starts at 6.30 p.m. Are there any other board announcements for this evening? Um, Madam Chair. Leadership, any other announcements? Oh, go ahead, Commissioner Treese. Uh, Chair, did you want to remind people about the conversations uh, tomorrow night and Saturday morning? Well, that's a very good point. Yes. Thank you very much. We've had two of our community investment conversation events to date, and we have two more opportunities. Tomorrow night, starting at 6 p.m., uh, it will be hosted by Commissioner Roy Rogers. Uh, as we all have passed the baton and taken responsibility for hosting these community investment conversations to really focus on our budget. That'll be Wednesday night, November 18th. Uh, and if you check out the Washington County calendar, you can hook right up with the Zoom link or it's also on our board meeting page. Then on Saturday, we're going to have the last of the four community investment conversations. This is our only daytime uh, community investment combo, and it will be running from 10 a.m. to noon, also brought to you or hosted on Zoom. And they are also hosted on YouTube as well, so you can participate that way, whichever is most comfortable and convenient for you. Thank you, Commissioner Trees. Is there, are there any other board announcements or anything else you two would like to expand on? Uh, Madam Chair, nope. we do have our one uh, commenter for the inn to provide public comment. He is back on for you. Hey, that's terrific. Well, welcome. Hello, Mr. Naharaja. Yes, Madam, Madam welcome Chair. Welcome back. Thank you, Madam Chair Harrington. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, we are able yes. to hear you. Please go ahead for up to five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, good, good evening, Madam Chair Harrington, Board of Commissioners. Thank you again for affording me this uh, public opportunity testimony today. My name is Kumar Naharaja. I'm a resident of Washington County. As a backdrop to this public testimony today, I thought it may be relevant for the board to know that I'm a volunteer registered with the serp R, which is the State Emergency Registry of Volunteers in Oregon to serve in the COVID-19 response. The statutory authority under which I signed up with Servor is um, ORS 401-651 subsection two. The uh, topic of my testimony today is the upcoming governor's statewide two-week two freeze starting tomorrow, ending 12-2-2020, and the county office closures to in-person access to the public in general. The governor in a press conference on 11-13 stated that the freeze will likely last four weeks in hotspots such as Multnomah County and Washington County is included as well. Um, I, I, I'm not, I, for the two weeks, um, the state of Oregon's newsroom hosted by the governor's official website um, in a media release stated that these, ris these risk reduction measures are critical in limiting the spread of COVID-19 and um, helping conserve hospital capacity so that all Oregonians can continue to have access to quality care. Um, the governor's two week freeze though is starting tomorrow, um, primarily targeting improper social gatherings and some businesses in house um, and excludes personal services such as barbers shops, salons, et cetera, from closures. And uh, this is specifically, as you all know, is to mitigate the current COVID-19 surge that threatens hospital capacity in Oregon. Um, the governor has clearly specified that personal services, uh, such as the ones that I specified, will remain open at this time. However, certain county and city offices in Washington County, such as uh, the libraries, um, the HPL Express, are closing services to the public, even when they are not the target of governor's upcoming freeze. And even as other county components continue to function, albeit at a restricted level. Um, on April 15, 2020, the governor signed Executive Order 2016, which, which was entitled Keep Government Working. 
um, pursuant to ORS chapter 401 at SEC, ORS 433 441, the governor via that order authorized state and local governments to take necessary measures to ensure continued operations, public participation in decision making, and the provision of essential government services in a safe manner during the COVID 19 outbreak. I understand that the county is taking efforts where possible to provide remote assistance. However, to highlight the problems of remote assistance, for this testimony, I will cite the example of um, performing legal research. In a legal research setting, remote assistance may have legal implications. It's welcome, but um, it may have legal implications. One, because by statute, the law librarian is prohibited from providing legal advice to patrons. Correspondence with law librarians via email may be discoverable by parties, as all county emails have public records, as well as litigation tactics. So I'm uh, requesting the a board to keep the public services, such as the county law library and HPL Express open and other county in-person services like the housing services open to the public. They are operating at a restricted level and I'm requesting them to maintain them at that pace because the governor has not targeted these um, businesses to close. And I support my statement with an article from the Oregonian um, authors or Andrew Thien and Brad Smith. Um, in an article dated November 13, they state Oregon governor orders two week coronavirus freeze, restricting bars and restaurants to take out closing some businesses. So it was not all businesses. And uh, I had the opportunity to listen to uh, the director of HHS, uh, Ms. Marnicole, who said in one of the uh, slides, she says, governor's free starts number 18 and requires all businesses to mandate that employees work from home and to close offices to the public, which is contradicting what the governor actually said. So I would like to um, ask the board, hear from the board, if um, the Washington County is implementing an order over and above what the governor has already um, implemented by way of the freeze, um, by way of escalating it to closure of all uh, public offices. So I would like to hear from the administration and the board as well. Thank you. Ms. Angie, uh, I would look to you and to Mr. Rapplier uh, and I'm wondering if it might help us to also uh, show the, the chart or the press release that the governor's office has given us that shows the categories that must be closed, um, if that's handy at all to also share on the screen. But I'd like to turn it over to the two of you. Uh, thank you, Chair Harrington, Board of Commissioners. I don't have that handy to display right now. Uh, maybe Clerk Moss, uh, if Marnie is still available, could help access that. Um, so I'm going to talk specifically about the law library because that's what the speaker was um, was raising. The law library services is um, currently remote, um, and they are able to email documents per their rules. Um, phone, remote services, and they do have some contact contactless checkout as well curbside. I will note um, that the law library staff worked with the law library advisory board on um, these uh, protocols and procedures. And on the law library advisory board, it includes um, attorneys, judges, and they support um, this measure um, in, um, in supporting the governor's freeze. So that's just a little bit more about the decision-making that went into um, the law library services. And if I may chime in, uh, the governor's orders uh, generally exempt the local governments and they're allowed to do what they want. And uh, we heard loud and clear from our health experts that it is extremely important to curb the spread of this. And so the advice from our experts is to limit services, close services, and that's what we're doing. And so it is an inconvenience to everybody, but that's just what has to happen. And also, uh, I have a question too. I know for uh, county government services, 
you are still handling things uh, over the phone and over the internet. And I'm wondering, uh, does the law library still have access over the telephone? Yes. Yes, they do. Remote services are available. Um, in all county services, um, there is um, a matrix on the county's website that lists um, how to access uh, county services and provides e uh, phone numbers as well. All righty. Commissioners, do you have any other questions from our staff? Well, the only thing I'd add is I uh, appreciate uh, various points of view. I appreciate the presenter uh, tonight uh, bringing his thoughts forward, but uh, I personally don't have any interest in revisiting that. I think we've made a decision and we need to uh, stay right where we are. Yep, I agree. We need to uh, really drive these numbers down and get out of this extreme risk. I know it's uh, off-putting for many over the next at least two weeks, if not longer, uh, but we, we really need to make sure that we're getting these numbers, uh, that we drive these numbers down uh, and in, in a more productive direction uh, for the sake of keeping, preserving our healthcare system and protecting lives uh, and reducing the struggles of our community members. Ah, thank you very much for bringing up uh, on the screen the listing that is available right from our county website that talks about uh, the law library having uh, remote assistance. So thank you very much. All right, Mr. Moss, do we have anyone else signed up for the today? We do not, Madam Chair. Okay, and commissioners, were there any other board announcements? Seeing none, no. Madam Chair, I move we adjourn. Okay, uh, we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously three to zero. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday for those of you that we won't see. And to everyone, please stay healthy. And between now and then, uh, see you on Zoom <laughs> or Teams or any other web application. Take, Take good care. care of yourselves and be safe. Yep. Yeah. Good night.